Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, and wherever you are in this wide, wonderful world that we live in today. My name is Jason Cooper. I am your host on this Mindful Leadership podcast. I'm a sales trainer, sales coach. I empower people through rapport that resonates with their customers and deliver inspiring results. It's all about relationships. It's all about connectivity. It's all about sitting in someone else's shoes and really understanding them empathetically. Today, and as always, I'm speaking to some wonderful dynamic leaders and find out exactly what they do in this ever-changing world. We'll be discussing all sorts of things, the sales, business, coaching, communication, and the mind, and everything to do with the mind. Today, my guest is Dr. Dawson Church. How are you today? I am doing magnificently, Jason. Thank you. And whereabouts are you in the world? I'm in Northern California. Northern California. Oh, lovely. I've just been speaking with someone on LinkedIn Live on in around Northern California, that sort of area. So it's absolutely wonderful to speak to you. Um, I, I think today we're going to have some really insightful conversations because I'm, I'm inspired by... Uh, what you've done and what you've what you're doing. So I'm going to give a little bit of a, a, a background for you. Um, extraordinary brain states transform ordinary people. So I'm inspired by that. You have three books under your name, um, and we'll talk about that in a short while. You're blending cutting edge neuroscience with stories, which makes an impact, and looking at different ways of, and capabilities on helping people to rewire their brain and to release the endorphins as if you're in an altered state. So all of these sort of areas, and you're a PhD, you're highly well-versed in this area, and you use a lot of different uh, ways and means of utilizing these states. But I'm, I'm fascinated. Rather than me talking about how wonderful you are, I think it's sometimes best for you to talk about how wonderful you are. And my first question to you is, you've got some brilliant knowledge and wonderful expertise out there, but what got you to where you are now? And give us a little bit of background to who, who you are. Well, my newest book is called Bliss Brain, and I got there, Jason, by starting off, as many of us do, with a lot of life challenges. When I was 15 years old, I, I tell the story in the book about how I was walking past a full length mirror and 15 years old, I had long hair. I was this skinny young man with bell bottom trousers. And I, I stared at my face in the mirror and the words popped into my head, those are the saddest eyes I've ever seen. I realized I was just terminally depressed, anxious, miserable, and had all the symptoms of PTSD. And I knew I needed to fix myself to have, have a good life. So I went to live on a spiritual community. I studied psychology. I tried all kinds of techniques, energy medicine, meditation, and so on, and got a little bit happier over the years. But when I began to meditate daily in my 40s, then things shifted for me really rapidly. And I discovered the, the magic of energy healing at that point, I began to research epigenetics, and I realized that as our consciousness changes, as our thoughts, as our emotions, as our beliefs change, all of these are intangibles, but they're producing tangible changes in our bodies. So I did some key studies on cortisol, showing that as we calm ourselves, our cortisol levels drop within about 20 minutes. It doesn't take, doesn't take very long. Now, of course, if you get upset or anxious or angry or any other negative emotion, your cortisol level rises. That only takes about two minutes to happen. If you calm yourself though, if you meditate, if you use EFT, time in nature, there are about 30 techniques that'll do this, evidence-based techniques, and they'll rapidly bring your, your level of cortisol down. I then realized that that had to be producing a shift in gene expression and the, the kinds of genes that were dialed up and dialed down. So I began studying those and in some, some research into veterans with PTSD, mm -hmm. me and my research team found that it was literally turning genes on to use these stress reduction practices. So at that point, I began to research them more intensively. I then became interested in elevated states, peak states, 
and wrote the book Bliss Brain because I found that I was getting into these extraordinary states of just basic irrational gratitude and happiness every day. So now I wake up happy, I go to bed happy, I'm happy almost every time, all through the day. In fact, this morning, I got a piece of bad news about one of my papers being rejected by a peer-reviewed journal. And you know, I was well, I was a little thoughtful for about five minutes, and then just you just you're resilient. You just bounce back right away. So I want to just share that with people. Let them know that you can get much happier than you are now. Research mm -hmm. with we we've done MRI studies with with monks and nuns shows you can get dramatically happier than most people realize you can. And these techniques are trainable. So that's really my focus now is training people in using these advanced stress reduction techniques and feeling better and really shedding those layers of trauma that I had when I was 15. You don't need, they don't help you now. And if you let go of them, you can have a magnificent life. That's awesome. So one of the key character traits of happiness, and just so as an example, just to say that, um, I wasn't as uh, vibrant as I am now, but what are the key traits and what do you need to do to do that, to get yourself back into that peak energy space where um, you feel happy, but you also have that energy around you where it sort of resonates with you and other people? Yeah, it's simple, Jason. All you have to do to get happy is you have to reverse the last 1 million years of evolution because evolution did not select for happiness. Evolution selected for paranoia, distrust, anger, rage, noticing the bad stuff around you and responding really, really quickly. So we have this set of genes called immediate early genes, and they turn on at the drop of a hat, and we get angry, we get resentful, we notice bad things immediately because that's how our ancestors avoided the tiger in the grass. So yes. our brains, are exquisitely attuned to noticing what's wrong and bad and out of place, and then reacting to it really, really, really fast with that cortisol response, with those immediate early genes turning on and making us stressed. And so now, after you know a million years of evolution, we're at the point where we aren't starving every day, which 100 years ago, our ancestors were 1,000 years ago. Starvation was the norm. We were competing for scarce resources. I mean, the last ice age in Europe was only 18,000 years ago. So yeah. very, very recently in evolutionary terms, we were competing with Neanderthals. There were Neanderthals around then. We were competing with different kinds of other hominids. And so uh, we've got all of this brain tissue and biology geared to stress. And if your ancestor was... Uh, inclined to not get stressed and your ancestor back along the evolutionary pathway was was the person who stopped and smelled the flowers and watched mm -hmm. the sunset that was the person who got eaten by the tiger so all we have to do to get happy is to reverse the whole process now it's hard to do that but the in, the amazing thing about neuroscience nowadays is when we put people who are extraordinarily happy, like these monks who spent 10,000 hours meditating. Mm -hmm. We put them in an MRI scanner, see what's happening in their brains. We can then reverse engineer that and then train people into those states really quickly. Like I do seven day retreats every once in a while, live retreats, and either they're live virtual or the live in person. And we hook people up to EEGs at those retreats and read mm -hmm. their brainwave patterns and, and how their brains are processing information. Initially, it takes them 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes to evoke an elevated state like that Tibetan monk with the right instructions. And so you can learn to get to those elevated states, not in 10,000 hours, but in just a few hours of, of the right kind of brain-informed training. But one lady at, in, at the retreat, she was there in about 20 minutes some day, one of the retreat, she was getting into those elevated emotional states, happy states, reversing that million years of evolution by making herself happy. By the seventh day, she was the quickest. She got to that state in 47 seconds, under a minute. And so we can retrain ourselves to do that. And to make yourself happy, you have to cultivate those qualities and you have to build enough neural wiring. So we all know that Hebb's law, neurons that fire together, wire together, you fire those neurons mm -hmm. of appreciation, of joy, of love, of equanimity over and over and over again throughout the day. And those circuits get big and strong. And then you get yeah. used to being in that state. And over time, you turn the state of happiness 
into the trait of happiness, that it's stable. That's why the subtitle of the book is Rewiring Your Brain for Resilience, Creativity, and Joy. And you literally produce neural wiring. How quick in eight weeks of doing this, you can produce an increase of about 20% in the emotion regulation circuits of your brain. Your brain's mm -hmm. rewiring itself really, really fast, turning those states into traits with these evidence-based techniques. That's really cool. And uh, uh, I've read all of Dr. Joe Dispenza's books uh, based on similar sort of stuff. Uh, and as you say, what fires together, wires together. And as, look, our brains are like big supercomputers. So whatever we say and whatever we suggest to it, that becomes the answer uh, of how we think and feel. And it is a super muscle. So like the rest of our body, which is a super muscle, has to be worked out as well. And I think our brain uh, connecting with the reptilian side of the brain needs work and needs a lot of effort because that reptilian brain is out there fighting against us and giving us negative patterns internally and it is fleeing, and especially in this day and age, because I think everything around us is pushing all these um, fight, flight, or flee responses to us, and, our, and our, the rest of the brain isn't catching up as quickly as we'd like to. So how do we adapt to this, and what, what would be a good resolution for people in this busy world that we live in right now, these busy, busy executives, and especially now in the online world, which is where we are right now and conversing with each other. So what is the good key thing for people to actually think of and communicate better with themselves and maybe with other people when they're doing this? Well, it's critical to use an evidence-based technique because there are a lot of good ideas about meditation, about stress reduction, but which of them are proven? And so, in Bliss Brain, for example, I looked at a lot of the claims of different meditation techniques in schools, and some of them are, are useful, but much of what is done in this field is just ritual. It's been handed down over hundreds of years, thousands of years even, and people reenact these rituals and say, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that. Well, when you have an MRI and put people in an MRI, you discover that a lot of the things people are doing are ineffective. But a few things are effective. And so things like, you know, the saffron robes and the 108 prayer beads, really, if they, if they prime your brain, predispose you to feel good, that's fine. But what we now know is that certain practices are, are powerful. And before we went live, we were talking about time and nature. Yeah. Time and nature is incredibly powerful, especially if you walk barefoot um, on damp grass or on, on the beach, then yeah. that produces an electromagnetic flow in your body that aligns you with the earth. So that's an evidence-based practice. Grounding is an evidence-based practice. Movement, Tai Chi, Qigong, Yoga, tapping, EFT, tapping, which is basically just applying pressure or tapping on acupuncture meridians. That, again, there are over 100 studies showing that's effective, over 1,000 studies showing that acupuncture is effective. So there are these techniques that'll do that, and you need to find what those are. I recommend experimenting with some and then using the ones that are good for you. But I, I believe that about 20 minutes of an effective meditation in the morning is the baseline for well-being. And so when you do that, you then predispose yourself to having a good day because you're framing your day in this, in this kind of perspective of goodwill, equanimity, serenity, resilience. So when you start your day that way, so before people look at their phones or social media or texts or any kind of reference point to the outside world, you wake up in the morning and in my books, I call this non-local mind. There's our local reality and that's, you know, our families and our kids and our, our money and our clients and our businesses, but there's a non-local reality. And the great sages throughout history, we mm -hmm. read about the poetry of Rumi and losing himself in this ecstatic kind of space or St. Catherine of Siena or St. Teresa of Avila, yeah. Francis. I mean, these people weren't stuck at the level of local reality. They had access to transcendent reality. And when you do that as your first act in the morning, especially when your brain waves are slow, because when we're asleep, our brains are in delta, the slowest wave. Yeah, I was just about to say the alpha, beta, and theta yeah. state. 
which so is a good space to be in, especially when you wake up first thing in the morning. Yes. And so you're still there. That if you then move right into meditation, right into communion with non-local mind, then the wisdom and creativity of non-local mind is accessed, and you then that then flows into your day. Napoleon Hill in his book Think and Grow Rich, chapter yeah. 50 of Think and Grow Rich, is all about how we cannot solve local mind problems local reality problems at the level of local mind. He had what he called his invisible council. He would go to these altered states and he'd basically commune with all these people in his invisible council. And then he would download this amazing information and these answers not accessible at the level of local reality. So you want to do that first thing in the morning and then you start your day that way. And that predisposes you to having a really creative day throughout the next 8, 12, 15 hours. And that's what we spoke about before we got on board is the inner coaches that you can have all these inner people. And that is that is loosely based on Napoleon Hill, Think Rich, Grow Rich. And that's a 30-day program that I've done, uh, like 90 minutes every day. But to have a conversation, but to build those conversations up, it's like building up an affirmation. But you are talking with yourself internally. But the, the conversations that you can have are quite surprising. And it's amazing what you can say to yourself to build out. And what I, what I said earlier, whatever you say to yourself comes out into fruition. But I also think there's a connectability between people. And that whether you say it, whether it's uh, you can connect with the third eye or whether there is some other element out there. But I do believe that there's something out there, whether you call it spiritual or what, whatever you want to call it, but what, what are your thoughts on that? Because I do believe that we're all connected somehow. There are different mechanisms that connect us. And one of those that everyone knows about nowadays is, is mirror neurons. As we yep. watch other people do an action, those same neurons fire in our brains. And you watch somebody, for example, who's doing an altruistic act, and your altruism network lights up. That's a part of the brain called the insula. And we, we see on MRI scans, that part of the brain brightly lit, both in people doing altruistic and compassionate things and people witnessing them. So that's one mechanism is mirror neurons. There are also energy fields and we have resonance among energy fields. And so if I have in my energy field, and these are measurable fields, they're measurable about three meters away from the human body. And so if I have a, an energy and I'm feeling that love, that compassion in my own heart, it communicates itself to people around me through the field. So field resonance is another way. And then in my book, Mind to Matter, I describe some advanced research being done with giant magnetometers in different locations in the, on the Earth's surface. And these are measuring geomagnetic fields, the, the field of the entire Earth, actually the whole, the whole solar system. Because when the sun has a sunspot, it changes the speed of the solar wind that is that is rushing past the earth at every moment and it distorts the earth's magnetic field this is this is measurable with these giant magnetometers and so in one astonishing set of studies that's been done over the last 10 years uh, some colleagues of mine were plotting these changes in these geomagnetic fields and they were doing it for a month so a month worth of changes to these sunspot based disturbances to the Earth's field, mm -hmm. they were plotting it against the heart rate variability of a meditator, and they found the two track each other. So wow. what I point out in Mind to Matter is that not only are we aligned with these huge cosmic cycles when we're in that inner state of connection with non-local mind, with non-local reality, with the field of consciousness itself, we are in communication, in sync with all of nature, and in sync with every other human being who is in sync with those great cosmic cycles. So you're doing a project and suddenly somebody phones you who hasn't phoned you for five years and it turns out they have the missing piece for that project. It's uncanny. We see in studies of meditators that they have large amounts, much more than average amounts of phenomena like synchronicity, clairvoyance, clairaudience, uh, psychokinesis, all of these things are happening more to meditators who are in tune, in sync 
for these huge cycles of people who are divorced from them. So there are all these, these mechanisms. There's resonance of our energy fields, there's mirror neurons, there are these magnetic cycles that we're, we're part of, these huge cosmic mm -hmm. cycles, and you realize we're all one at that level, and you start to act and live that way, and it's a whole different perspective from being an isolated, lonely, little limited human being. You know you're part of something enormous, and you live your life that way every day. Uh, there's a big talk today, and that's really fascinating. Uh, and uh, I've got about a thousand questions I want to ask at the same time. I'm not quite sure which one to ask, but um, there's there's a great synchronicity between the stomach, which is the gut, and the vagus nerve that goes right up to the brain. And I recently wrote a piece about um, trusting that gut feeling, or do you trust the heart, or do you trust the head? And you check in with each location as you go through it to find out which is the one. But the gut feel is such an emotion. Uh, I would say it's an emotional thing, but we are all interconnected. But that, you know, when you get that sudden feeling of either deja vu or I wish I trust my gut. And most times that you're right, because your gut is whether there are some neurons in there, which is connected to, to the brain. But the rational part of the, the, the neocortex that takes over and the brain takes over. So what's your feeling and what's your take on that? Because I think we should all trust our gut feeling a little bit more because that the whole body is connected in some realm and ways of mean. Yeah, and there are there are nerve plexuses in the gut and also in the heart. The heart has a lot of, it's a, it's a like little, little brain. And so different parts of the body have their own neural networks like that. And one of the fascinating things about the brain scans of people doing this. Why well, did one MRI study? We randomized people into two groups. One did this science-based meditation that I teach called eco-meditation for a month. They did 22-minute eco-meditation for 28 days. The second mm -hmm. group did, did, did control meditation that was just basically mindful breathing. So we had the mindful breathing group, we had the eco-meditation group, and we saw in the meditation group, the ones that, that did the real meditation, that after a month, their brains were changing functionally and anatomically. And that that part of the brain, the insula, was all lit up. There was highly active insula activation in the group that did the real meditation. But the other thing that happened was the prefrontal cortex, especially the mid-prefrontal cortex, shut down. And the mid-prefrontal cortex is the, the seat of self-reflective thought and most self-reflective thought is negative thinking about the vast majority of thoughts we have about ourselves is worry about the past concern for the future and that part of the brain literally shut down so what we see in mri studies like what i just mentioned is that the brain function and structure is changing in only 28 days and that thinking part of the brain is quiet now with that thinking part of the brain it doesn't mean it's turned off completely but it's down-regulated. So that worried part, that self-absorbed part, that local reality-focused part gets quiet. That lets people hear those neural plexuses in the heart, in the gut, and then your brain actually is functioning much more efficiently and working a lot less hard. And so neurologically, that's exactly what we see. That's absolutely awesome. So yeah, I had a really good uh, a visual image in my head because once you do storytelling and what you've just suggested, there is the, the areas of the brain. I know there's been lots of studies in this because I've had like look at looking in this uh, area because I'm fascinated by the brain and how we work and how we operate. But I know there's a, a direct synchronization when you tell a story and especially using the sensory information, our brains light up exactly the same. And I think he is, as you suggested, it's those mirror neurons. So the more, you can use sensory information. It We both light up on our, on our areas of the brain. So I think that's how you can impact people more by the uses of storytelling and how you can impact people and other people in the same way. What's your take on that? How do you see that? Yeah, stories are, are really important and evoke emotion. And so in all my books, you'll see I 
give you the science, there's all the studies, all the, the facts, all the evidence there, and then I'll tell a story. Like there was one woman whose story I tell, a very brief one in this brain. Her name is Toni Tomlinson, and she gave us permission to use her, her real life words. And she wrote after doing meditation the first time, she said, I'm stressed with high cortisol about 99% of the time. I'm burned out on life, on parenting, and I've tried meditation and it hasn't worked. So when I sat down to do your meditation, my mind said, Tony, you failed at every other meditation method. You'll fail at this one too. But when I used those seven simple steps and hit step three of the meditation, she says, tears of bliss began to flow down my cheeks and I was at the place I've always wanted to be. I'm gonna do meditation now every single day. So we get stories like this coming in every week from people who are trying these effective techniques, evidence-based techniques, and they're having radical shifts in their ability, and then their lives start to change as well. So stories are vital, and they give us an emotional connection that just the raw science doesn't give us. That's absolutely awesome. I just wanted to highlight this for the audio people uh, that are listening on uh, Apple and Spotify and all of that. EFT is emotional freedom technique. And I just wanted to highlight that because the acronym, some people might not know what that actually is or means. Uh, I was taught that about three or four years ago on how to do it. Uh, I've never done it. I'm always curious to learn something new. Could you describe exactly what EFT means and describe the sensation when you're actually doing that and how you can actually impact that on other people because I want other people to learn and I want other people to grow when they listen to this and maybe understand how we can add value forward and make an impact to other people that may be stressed out, may be worried about this, that and the other, but how we can make an impact? EFT is the quickest stress reduction technique I've discovered for use in moment-to-moment -moment situations throughout the day. So meditation gives you that framing for your day of inner peace and equanimity, creativity and resilience, but then you go to work, it's 10.30 a.m., you get a troublesome email from a colleague, you have a phone call, you discover something in a project that isn't going well, and you then get upset, disturbed, and distressed. So what do you do? And EFT takes two minutes to do. You quickly then use EFT and it calms you down. And it simply involves thinking about the bad thing, the problem you're having, and then tapping on a series of eight acupuncture points. And these are very precise points in the body. We can measure them with a galvanometer. And you tap on the end point of your acupuncture meridians, and then you quickly calm down. We've used this for, we've used this at this point with over 21,000 war veterans with PTSD. We've done seven randomized controlled trials. They show that veterans quickly recover. One veteran, for example, I tapped with, did EFT with, he was really triggered because he was thinking back to a time when he was serving in, in Iraq and he, one of his friends was killed and he was a medic and he had to clean the uniform of his dead friend to send back to the, to the, to the family because the, 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 the possessions of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the dead soldier were being sent back to his family in the US. And so this young man was incredibly triggered as he thought back to cleaning the helmet, cleaning the, the, the uniform. And it, the, the smell was so bad of this, helmet and uh, the uniform, he was literally there in the medic hut and he'd have to go outside and take a breath of fresh air, gulp some air and then run back inside, do more cleaning, run back outside again because the, just the smell was so bad in there. So we worked on the smell with EFT, doing the tapping on each of these acupuncture points and he went rapidly from extreme emotional triggering, 10 out of 10, down to a zero. I ran into wow. this soldier again and about three months after that, I said, let's talk about cleaning the helmet, cleaning the uniform, what's your number now? And he said, you know, I realized that I'm glad I was the one who got selected for, for that duty. I was his friend and I could do that and know the meaning of his life. So, I, you know, so this young soldier went from being 10 out of 10 triggered to being zero. 
and friendship from one of lost tragedy. So that's the effect that EFT has. And it's usually permanent. Once people have broken the fight or flight association with the memory one time through the, the acupressure, it stays broken subsequently as well. Wow, that's really good. I love that. That's a really good uh, story. And I, I've, I've done EFT. I don't practice it a lot, but I've I've been taught how to do it. And for the, the non-academics out there, it's uh, points on your head, it's points on your cheeks and uh, under your nose and on, on your chin and then on your rib cages. And then you go around points on your arms and so on and so forth. But it's almost like an affirmation every time that you're touching your face. That's a very quick synopsis of it. Uh, so for people that want to find out a little bit more about that, there's lots of tons of information on uh, Dr. Dawson's uh, website and lots more of, uh, other stuff to, to in, enhance you. So question I'm going to ask you actually is, if you were interviewing you, what question would you ask you? <laughs> Too funny, Jason. No one's ever asked me that before. So, uh, yeah, if I were to spin my chair around and be the interviewer rather than the interviewee, what would be my favorite question? And I think what I would ask myself was, what what motivates me? Because it there are things that really motivate me, and I would want to know why I do what I do. I'm past retirement age. I you know I could have retired five years ago. And I just, I, I work, um, I take a lot of retreats and breaks throughout the year, but I, I work like, you know, 10, 15 hours a day because I'm utterly passionate about what I do. And what motivates mm -hmm. me is the, just the suffering I see of people around me. And Jason, it touches me because it's unnecessary. I mean, there's, there's suffering that is, that is inevitable. Maybe you have a genetic disease, maybe you have some terrible tragedy, but most people are suffering from afflictions that are only in their minds. Uh, they're just mental. They're, they're anxiety, depression. The World Health Organization reported recently that globally, rates of anxiety and depression are hovering close to 30%. They're higher right. than they've ever been before. And often it's not to do with starving like your ancestor did or, be, or being in an in a environment with tigers and Neanderthals. People are just being driven crazy and into anxiety and depression by the paper tigers in their minds. And so I see yeah. so many people suffering unnecessarily, and I am just driven with a passion every day to release that suffering, to reduce that suffering. And I see the MRI scans. I know that people can get over their binge eating, their, um, their binge negative thinking, their unhelpful habits. It's possible to get over all these things if you use scientifically based methods like EFT, like eco meditation, like Tai Chi and Qigong, like rounding. I mean, there is such a wealth of these, these techniques available to us nowadays. And so I'm just driven every day with a passion for doing this. And I'm also an investor. I invest in various uh, kinds of uh, mostly stocks. And I watch people like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger who run, run Ber Berkshire Hathaway in their 90s and did they retire at 65? Absolutely not. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're doing what you love, if you're living your passion, you will never work a day in your life. You will just be living that passion and then doing what motivates you. So what motivates me is seeing that suffering released. And my, my message is that suffering, the vast majority of our suffering is simply produced by our minds. You can escape that suffering and live a dramatically happier and more empowered life. So that's really the question I'd ask myself. And whenever I ask myself why I'm doing what I'm doing on the 15th hour of the day, it's that. It's it's that releasing unnecessary suffering. Yeah. That's absolutely awesome. And it's also finding your purpose in life, I think, uh, which leads to your success and leads you to wake up and you work in and you're doing what you need to be doing. But you don't need to be paid for it because it's your purpose in life. You get from A to B and you get in that flow state and your flow state gets you around and before you know it, time disappears and you're just doing what you love. And I can see that from yourself. It's taken me a few years to get to where I need to be in life. And what I do and what I love to do is inspiring and helping others see 
something from a slightly different point of view. So you've definitely done that today. So how can people find out more about you? Well, the best way to do that is to go to the website blissbrain.com. Blissbrain is my newest book at blissbrain.com. We I have a wonderful publishing house. And they actually gave us a whole bunch of a whole printing of the books at costs. We're giving them away at blissbrain.com, along with eight meditations from the book. And these are powerful, powerful meditations that actually bring you into those elevated states that Tony Tomlinson mentioned and I talked about repeatedly. So you want to get into those states and start that process of brain rewiring. Now you're turning on the happy circuits, the joyful circuits, the compassion circuits, the attention circuits every single day. And then you build those circuits, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then after a while, you turn that happy state into a happy trait. So thisbrain.com is where you can get both meditations and also the book and start there. The other thing that I recommend now, especially, is um, we discovered a few years ago doing a couple of studies that EFT and the meditation both raise your levels of immune antibodies. In two studies published in, in medical journals, we, we showed that doing this for a week raises your levels of immune antibodies by over 100%. So you have a lot wow. more circulating immune antibodies. And these are the antibodies that are called immunoglobulins, and they actually bind to the spike protein on coronaviruses and neutralize them. So um, we are really recommending people do those meditations. And those that meditation geared to immunity is at the website Dawson, my name, DawsonGift.com. So again, BlissBrain.com for the book and all the methods, and then DawsonGift.com for that immunity meditation. It's right at the top of the page there. You'll also get a free copy of the EFT Tapping Mini Manual, and just go to the back of the book. On one page, you'll see the tapping points. Give it a try. You'll be amazed by how you'll literally feel the, the shifts in your body. So again, BlissBrain.com for the book, and then tapping, uh, I'm sorry, DawsonGift.com for the tapping information and the meditation. Awesome. That I, I'm going to go and check out all of those and uh, uh, have a go of the meditations. And because I, I, I like an eclectic varied amount, uh, something that I do before I go to bed is I uh, meditate and self self meditation and sometimes guided, uh, sometimes I'm a little bit too lazy. So it's a guided meditation it actually gets me into that space very quickly. And uh, it's less work because someone else is speaking to you and gets you into that place. So I appreciate your time today. And I really thank you for uh, what you've given forward. And I'm sure this is all about giving forward and giving golden nuggets of knowledge, information, process techniques and understanding that can enrich everyone's world and everyone's life to make whatever people suggest and whatever people do is helping people to grow. So that's where the area that I'm into. So thank you so much. Oh, it's a joy. I love sharing this and thank you for sharing it with all the people who are here today too. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. I plan to.